Thank you, Bailey, for that. Okay. Um, wonderful. So, sorry, guys. Okay. Um, so next week, when we finish up, we will wrap up talking about the organizational model. Um, we're going to be talking about people and, and what it looks like to succeed through others inside of our business and uh, how and when and why. And, and once again, a conversation that we have from the get-go because they all work together, right? Or remember this uh, uh, graphic, right? They all work together. This is a, this is a synergistic model. Of, of how everything impacts one another, right? We started with the economic model, which was, uh, which was our pro forma. This was how we knew what had to happen inside of our business, right? To make X amount of dollars, I have to have this many closings and to have this many closings, I have to have this many clients and to have this many clients, I have to go on this many appointments. And this many of them will be listings and this many of them will be buyers and then I came to this one number that I need to focus on in my business to make everything else happen. And that's how many listing appointments I need to go on every week, right? We worked all the way down. Well, that economic model is then supported by our lead generation model. Okay, so if I need to go on one appointment a week or one appointment a month or one appointment a day, whatever our number was, What's the lead generation that has to happen in our world that makes that happen, right? How do we systematically communicate with people, um, um, prospect and market, build our database so that I can be sure that I'm having, you know, X amount of appointments every, every week to lead to X amount of, of agreements, which lead to X amount of closings, which leads to X amount of income right? Um, so, so they all work together and it's supported by that budget model, right? And as we're looking at this, um, they all impact one another, right? Next week, we're, we're going to bring the organizational model into play. And that's about the people in our business. But imagine this, imagine growing your business to the point where you need to bring a person inside of it. What happens to your economic model at that point? What happens to your lead generation model? What happens to your budget model? Everything shifts and changes to support it. Um, today, when we talk about the budget model, we're going to start with your profit in mind, right? So what happens if your decisions on profit change? Or as your business grows, you want to keep a consistent percentage of profit. What happens inside of your budget model? Um, what are the targets you should be shooting for? What are the best practices there? And so we're going to go into some of those pieces as we explore the budget model. So as with the rest of the series, um, yet not as much. There are some page numbers on here. So if there's something you want to refer back to, um, you definitely can in your MREA. So that's why I, I wanted you to have it with you so that if there's something you want to dive deeper into, you can open up that page, you can circle, highlight, star, dog ear, do whatever you need to do um, to be able to come back to that page um, as we get going. So we start out on page 152. Um, just like with the other models, right? The budget model is broken up into two sections in your book. The first is the overview of the budget model. And then, you know, 100-ish pages later, not even that many, like 50 pages later, is the MREA budget model, which is really specifically what do millionaire real estate agents look at for their for their budget model. So all in, you've got like maybe 10 pages of your book that's devoted specifically to the budget model. Yet it is the one area of your book that you actually have the most supporting information outside of your reading material for. So I'm going to share, I'm going to share a great resource with you at the end of the day as well. Um, but so we we dive in uh, to page 152 and we start looking at um, at the budget model, and we're gonna we're gonna learn um, some some principles of this model. Three key areas. First is to lead with revenue, not with expenses. To play red light, green light, and to stick to our budget model by creating a natural rhythm inside of there. So, let's start with that first one. Lead with revenue. Um, what do you think this means? Go ahead and unmute yourself. You can share. What does it mean to lead with revenue? 
if you don't have any money bank, you better not be spending. I love that, Donna. Yeah. If you don't have any revenue, don't spend any money, right? Um, I'll tell you, when I first heard this, when I first heard the term lead with revenue before I had read the millionaire real estate agent, you know what I thought it meant? You got to spend money to make money. So go lead with revenue. Uh, and then I actually broke down what those words mean and lead with revenue does not mean that. That would be leading with expenses, right? Which is the opposite of leading with revenue. Yet it's what a lot of agents do. They lead with expenses. So leading with revenue instead um, um, it means a few things. First is that you have a cash-based business. You're literally not spending money you haven't earned, or you're not you're not um, um, leveraging debt to grow your business, right? You're not you're not putting it on your credit card, right? Oh, I need you know lead generation would be a great example of that. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy some leads, and Zillow can just build my credit card. I know I'll get a deal out of it eventually, and it, I'll just pay it all off, right? Um, we want to go the opposite of that, right? Once we've once we've got that business in, we can reinvest part of our revenue in growing our business in whatever way that is. Um, you know, I, I love this. Gary says in this part of the book, he says, often the difference between a successful startup business and an unsuccessful one is decided before the business ever opens it doors. And, and that decision is based largely in, are they leading with revenue or are they leading with expenses? Are they leveraging themselves to get into this opportunity? You know, the beautiful thing about our real estate in, industry is that, um, is that we can leverage elbow grease to get us pretty far. Not every industry is built that way, but in real estate, we can kind of hit the pavement and with low cost or no cost activities, prospect and market ourselves into business, right? So lead with revenue. Um, this is a really, really great place to have some coaching or accountability in your business, especially if, um, especially if you may um, you may be newer inside of the business, right? Um, what would be a good investment? What would be a, a waste of my time? What could a return on this investment look like? Um, um, and how will I know whether or not it's worth continuing? Uh, all of those pieces. It's a great place to get your to get your coach involved inside of that conversation. <clears throat> The next piece is to play red light, green light. So playing red light, green light is um, obviously not the preschool game that I'm familiar with right now. Um, playing red light, green light um, is, is how you know when and how much and where to spend money in your business. Really, it's about being able to, um, to fund an initiative long enough to determine whether or not it's successful. Um, and then using the results of that initiative to decide whether or not to move forward or to ramp it up or ramp it down, right? So playing red light, green light. Before I pour more money into this marketing, right, I need to see what kind of results this marketing is giving me. Before I pour more money into this lead generation source or this marketing stream, right? Or this, you know, particular postcard or into this neighborhood. I need to at least do that activity long enough to see what a return on that investment would be for a set period of time. Notate my return on that investment, determine whether or not it's worth me going forward with it, right? Um, and you get to decide what that return on investment should be in your business, right? Some people are really comfortable with a, you know, with a, a two times return on my investment. I spent a dollar and I made two. Um, for a lot of us, our elbow grease is going to be worth a little more than that. The time and effort we put in is going to be more than that. So what am I looking for? Am I looking for a five times return on that investment, a 10 times, a hundred time return on that investment? You know, what makes that particular um, 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 investment in your business worth it? And, and remember, I said investment, right? Because we shouldn't be just spending money in our business. We shouldn't be just creating expenses for no reason. We should be expecting something in return. 
And, and so that's what an investment is, right? When, when I have a capital output, that should give me a capital input. Now, the return on that investment is what is that capital input? What is coming back to me, right? Um, so I can have a less than, you know, one time return on investment, which means I lost money on that endeavor, um, or I can have something greater. So, so think about, think about, um, the money that you're spending in your business from a from an investment standpoint, right? What does that investment look like? And then stick to your budget model. You should annually be creating a budget for your business that is based on your economic model and supports your lead generation model, right? So your economic model is um, is a business plan. This is a pro forma that says, this is what I should expect in my business. Now, if my economic model says I'm going to, you know, make a million dollars this year and I have to sell 174 homes to do that, right? If that's what my economic model says, but then my budget model is based off of $200,000 of revenue, not a million dollars in revenue, then can I actually support my lead generation model? Right. I probably won't have enough in my budget to support my lead generation or the people I need in our in, in the business to do that piece either. But we'll we'll get there next week. But so does my does my budget model support my economic model? Um, and then am I sticking with it regularly on a percentage basis as opposed to a dollar basis? Right. And we're going to look at that today, really, really focusing on what percentage of our budget we're spending where. Because let's just use that same example. My economic model says I'm going to make a million dollars this year. I'm going to sell 174 homes. And I am six months through the year and I've sold 12 homes instead of the, you know, 80 that I, 90 or whatever it is that I need to have to be on track for that. Am I scaling my budget back and spending a percentage of my revenues on those supporting areas instead of uh, spending a fixed dollar amount, right? A fixed dollar amount, let's say my marketing budget is, is going to be X percentage of my business versus it's going to be, you know, um, $48,000 because $48,000 to support a million dollar business looks really different than $48,000 to support a $200,000 business, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what does your budget model stick to the percentages? So, um, 152 gets into this. Your budget is a tool. Your budget should be written down right? Um, um, annually should be, should be recorded and projected for the following year based on your economic model and your lead generation model, right? Um, but it has a partner and that partner is the profit and loss statement. The budget is what I project and what my goal is and the profit and loss statement is what actually happened. And the two go hand in hand. One shouldn't exist without another. And you definitely need both of those tools inside of your business. Um, and you should start right away um, on those. Even if you don't have a budget this year, start with a profit and loss because then you'll be able to look at what your expenses are this year in business and your revenues and create a successful budget next year off of it, right? So you can see where you're at um, going there. So your budget is a planning tool, right? You should create this annually. Um, this budget should both project your revenue and your cash flow as well as your expenses. So many of us think that our budget is just about how much I spend and where I spend it. But, but a, a maybe more important piece is where do I earn money? And how much do I expect to earn, spend, and invest in my business? Um, and then restrain the gain. This is all about having, having eyes on your budget and tightening it up as often and, and as fiercely as you can, because 1% at a time, it will start to, it will start to, to increase on you and it will cut into your profit, right? Um, your profit and loss statement is a management tool, 
I would highly advise you are using some, some sort of accounting system. Um, QuickBooks is, is great. It's easy. It's accessible. It's affordable. Um, it's really easy to use. Um, you, can, you can have it linked directly with your bank accounts or credit cards or whatever that is, and, and it makes life pretty easy, right? Um, as your business gets more advanced, um, your administrative team may start um, doing some of your bookkeeping, but you'll work with an accountant who's helping you keep an eye on the big picture. You should be reviewing your P&L at the very least bi-weekly. Some people go on to a weekly structure so that they know exactly where their money is. Um, uh, your P&L should show your actuals, what you've actually earned versus where you projected you would be versus what you budgeted. Um, so it should have a side-by-side -side comparison. This is where you are today and this is where you thought you'd be. That's really important to be able to look at both of those numbers right next to each other and engage where you're at. It's it's an easy way as you're doing these bi-weekly reviews in your business to identify whether or not you're on track or if you need to make adjustments. Uh, and when you make adjustments, adjust to win, right? Um, you want to adjust on the side of of, uh, of adding more profit into your business. Your budget's probably more conservative than you needed. Um, so stick to your budget. And if you need to make adjustments, make adjustments in your P&L and do it quickly. If you're showing that you're overspent in one category or you're, you're under earned in your revenue categories, then you need to play red light, green light and pump the brakes right away on something until you start seeing the appropriate return on something. So. Remember that the, that that what you're spending money on in your business should generate a return. If it doesn't, you're spending money. If it does, it's an investment. So invest your money, don't spend it. Um, and practice accountability, not accounting. You don't need to be an accountant. You don't have to. You don't have to. Um, be strategic with your P&L for tax time. Let your accountant be strategic with your P&L for tax time. You need to be real about your P&L for accountability. You need to be real about where you're actually spending money um, instead of just adding things to it because it's a good write-off or, you know, or, or moving things around from one category to another. Be very, very transparent for yourself with where you're spending money, where your revenue is coming from, code things into the right account consistently and use it as an accountability tool. Um, if your accountant needs to make adjustments to your P&L at the end of the year for tax purposes, this is awesome. Let them do that. But you need to have it look like it actually does in your business for, for accountability purposes. So um, just kind of some, um, some, some advice that I've gotten along the way there. Um, some of the items you're going to find in your, um, um, on your P&L, okay? Um, the cost of sales which is the cost of acquiring revenue. Cost of sales is a challenging um, um, thing to define in your business for, for some people. Um, a, a lot of times it gets confused with certain operating expenses, but we're going to dive into these pieces today. Uh, cost of sales, um, gross profit, right? So gross profit is your revenue left over after your cost of sales. So, um, um, out of my gross profit comes my operating expenses. And after all of my expenses are paid, that is my net income. So that's my pre-taxed pre income after my cost of sale and my operating expenses. So um, let me, no, oh, it, it doesn't, it, in another slide or two, we get really specific, but let me give you a general overview. Um, obviously you can find more on page 193. Um, what are all of these pieces, but your cost of acquiring revenue, what's your cost of sales? Well, um, we'll start off with, with something that all of us are subject to, and that is your splits, right? Um, whatever you pay your brokerage in the terms of your splits is a cost of sale, okay? Um, um, gross it, commission incomes comes off on the top and then your split comes in right after that. Um, so that's your cost of sale. You wouldn't have that cost if you didn't do that business, right? You don't have to pay a split off of commission that's not earned. 
um, for some of us and um, um, as our businesses grow, we end up bringing in other real estate professionals, right? Um, and so this might be a showing assistant or a buyer's agent or another agent inside of our world or on our team. And so a cost of sales there would be whatever that agent split is, right? So if, if we're on a 50-50 split and you're on my team, what actually happens is I, as the team owner, that is my business, that is my lead, that is my client, whatever it is, and I am paying you 50% of that commission to service that client. So think of it that way um, for a cost of sale that's split to the agent who's in your organization becomes a cost of sale. Oftentimes, I will hear, um, I will hear um, things like listing marketing being added to the cost of sale category. Uh, because a lot of people equate cost of sales with, well, if I didn't get the business, I wouldn't have to pay that money. And so if I didn't get a listing, I wouldn't have to pay to market that listing, right? But the reality is whether that listing sells or not, you're still paying to market that listing, right? You're still paying for photography. You're still paying for marketing materials. You're still paying for, you know, um, the sign to go up in the yard, whatever the case may be. So those are actually operating expenses. They're not a cost of sale. Um, you know, other things people like to put in that cost of sale category would be like client gifts, right? Well, I wouldn't have bought you a client gift if we didn't make it to the closing table. Um, and, and the reality is that's an optional expense and it's not a requirement. You could have still done that business without that closing gift. And that's probably much better categorized in, um, in perhaps a marketing category, because what are you really doing with that gift? right? You're marketing for future business, right? You are promoting yourself to, to, to your clients and giving them something that can be left behind to market your business with in the future, right? Um, so um, all of that um, rolls into um, um, other items that would fall under operating expenses. Depending on how you operate your business, um, this will include at any any costs associated with actually doing your business, right? I'm I'm doing my marketing, I'm doing my advertising, I'm doing my lead generation, I got my continuing education, I've got to pay for the MLS, I pay for my office fee or ENO insurance, and and all of those pieces, right, are an operating expense. Depending on advice from your accountant and the use of other personal items for your business, it might include your automobile, it might include your telephone, it might include some of those pieces, right? Those, those may be other business expenses. Now, um, if you have a vehicle that is specifically for real estate, right? Or if you have a vehicle that you wouldn't have purchased outside of real estate and you could, and if it's in your real estate budget, right? It may very well be a, an operating expense. It might also be a personal expense that doesn't actually fall on your business budget. Um, so that's, that's something to seriously consider during budget time in cons consultation with your financial team, with your accountant or your CPA, like, what does this look like based on my business entity, the way I own this asset or the way I pay this expense, the way that I use it, is it an operating expense for my business or is it a personal expense? So there are a few things that are kind of a gray area there. Um, but anything that's directly related to your business that if you didn't have a real estate business, you would not be paying for is an operating expense, right? Including entertaining your clients, right? Would you have taken so-and-so out to dinner or for a lunch if you weren't listing their home, right? Now that may be a client expense. So, um, um, so some of those pieces there, um, travel for training events may be an operating expense as well. Would you be going to Austin in August if we didn't have a convention there? I wouldn't, right? Um, so that's definitely uh, an operating expense for my business. Some of the benchmarks in the budget model, right? We just learned about cost of sale, operating expenses, and our net income, which is also known as profit, right? Um, about 30% of what we spend becomes a cost of sales. 
about 30% of, of what we earn comes in expense and operating expense and about 40% should become profit. Now, this model is based on the millionaire real estate agent business. As you get started in your business, it's very likely that you'll actually be able to take home more to the bottom line and more net income because your cost of sale may be substantially less than 30% if you're not paying another agent. If you don't have a buyer's agent or a showing assistant or anything like that, then your cost of sales may not be as high as 30%, right? Um, your operating expenses also may not be as high as 30%, depending on uh, a couple of big categories, which we're going to look at, such as salaries or lead generation. If you don't have a uh, um, uh, an employee in your business, like an administrative person or, or something like that, then your salaries category is probably much lower and you'll be able to take home more to the bottom line. But this is the kind of the ideal ratio when you get to that gross a million business. I'm sorry, no, when you get to that net a million business and you're bringing home a million dollars a year, um, um, this becomes kind of that ideal model and where, where you want that to go. So, um, so here's, here's some of those percentages. Remember I, I mentioned you want to base your budget off of percentage of your revenue versus dollar amounts, right? Um, so you can see that there are some dollar amounts here, but they're based off of a percentage of gross commission income. They're based off of a percentage of that re revenue. So, um, so in this example, we've got their revenue um, um, coming in, right? So this is the millionaire real estate agent model, right? And you can see more about this on page 157. So they're going to net a million dollars, which means their cost of sale is seven, 750,000 and their operating expenses are 750,000. And the way that that's broke up, you can see there's two big categories in there, compensation and lead generation. Um, so inside of your business, do you have a lead generation bucket? Let me ask that first, right? Because um, it's definitely a place where, um, uh, where if you're relying solely on elbow grease lead generation, um, you, you may be under budgeting and underfunding your business and limiting your potential. Remember, your budget needs to match your economic model. So what is that? What is that? Uh, what is that ratio? and we lead with revenue. So um, have, you, have you earned the revenue required to put 9% of your, of your earnings aside for lead generation, right? Have you got that or would you have to finance that, right? If you'd have to finance that, then continue with the elbow grease and keep going, right? Um, um, other categories, occupancy, education and coaching, um, supplies and office expenses, your communication and technology, um, automotive expenses in this case. Um, they also have some office equipment, um, uh, business insurance, and so their total operating expenses here. Notice that they're all based off of a, a percentage. So here's some best practices based on where you might be in your business. So that top line is gross commission income starting at 150,000 a year and working its way up to that gross a million, which is a million dollars in gross commission income and net a million, which is 2.5 million in gross commission income. You'll see it's not until you get to that net a million place where you're at that 30% uh, cost of sales with 30% expenses leads you to 40% profit. But when you're over here in the 150,000 in gross commission income range, your net income that is actually much higher, right? So your percentage of profit is more than 40%. In this example, it's at 50%. And I would challenge that it could be a lot higher than that. Um, I know many agents who are in these first, you know, two or three categories who are making upwards of 60% profit in their business, right? Um, now, should they be is a whole nother question, but they can be, right? So in this case, their cost of sales is just 13% of their, of their gross commission income. Um, 
So their expenses are just 38% of their gross commission income. And so, you know, 38% of 150,000, that's $57,000 a year in this area. Um, and now if, if somebody who's at this point is looking to move up to that next benchmark, that 340,000, yeah, their expenses may be that high because they probably have a, a, an administrative assistant who's helping to support them in their business. So they have salaries and they've probably upped their lead generation budget. So it can support a higher, uh, a higher revenue range, right? Um, but does it need to be if that's not their intention, if that's not where they want to go? That's, I think, where agents can, can uh, bring home higher than 40%. Um, so this just breaks it down even further, uh, shows you kind of where the percentages are, are allocated into different funds. So you'll see of that gross commission income, um, lead generation and compensation are the biggest categories. Salaries and benefits takes up the biggest chunk. Professional services, um, you know, this might be um, hiring um, hiring somebody for something, right? So it's um, it's going to be hiring somebody to do a service for you in your business. It's going to be a courier, the sign installer, the photographer, right? Those are the professional services that you're paying for out of your pocket. Um, In lead generation, listing management goes into lead generation. So when I take a listing, I have the photography, which allows me to put a sign in the yard. That sign is for lead generation. Those photographs turn into marketing, which is lead generation. Um, if I print brochures, if I am um, sending out postcards to support that listing, those are lead generation uh, pieces, right? So all of that listing management and marketing, anything marketing is going to go in that lead generation bucket. So, um, and then general prospecting and marketing. So if I have Facebook leads coming in, that's where I would be advertising my Facebook leads. If I'm holding client appreciation events, that's where this is going. An entire event goes in here to prospecting and marketing, right? Um, it doesn't, it doesn't fall anywhere else in any other category. We do those things because we're looking to generate leads. The purpose of that is to get more business, which means we're generating leads. Occupancy is going to be your specific workspace. So if you are working from the office and you have an office space, your occupancy might be $150 or $200 a month. If you're working from home, then you're probably saving on that occupancy budget unless you've worked with your accountant and you're billing yourself back for that space from your house, right? That's, that's something that could happen. Um, um, so your occupancy budget, as your organization grows, so does the space you need. So your budget's going to have to increase as well, right? Education and coaching. Um, if you've been in the past or will be in the future part of our productivity coaching programs, if you're working with Donna or you've worked with Angela in the past, right? Um, um, your education and coaching is actually an expense in your business, right? So it's not a, um, it, it's not truly a cost of sale. It becomes an expense for you. And you can write that off here because it's, it's a, a service that you're getting from that, uh, from that service provider, right? Your education and coaching, um, supplies and office expenses, um, um, if you're if you're uh, running to Office Max to pick up something, right? All of that's going to going to end up in there. Um, but you could also include um, um, your you know some pieces of the monthly office bill. In fact, when you get your monthly office bill from us, it's broken up into categories, and you could book each one of those categories somewhere separately um, in your in your P and L, right? So they all kind of support a different area. Um, you know, the ALC events fund would be under general prospecting and marketing, right? That's a lead generation expense. Um, the ALC or the uh, e and insurance as part of that would be insurance, right? Um, general um, office supplies and expenses um, wouldn't really fall in there. Um, but communications and technology, right? You pay the KW technology fee inside of that, um, which would support that technology piece. So you could actually break that down further and categorize those expenses um, even more. Um, automobile expenses, right? If you've worked with your accountant and it makes sense for your business to own that automobile, here you go. Um, it may also be um, um, 
you know, gas or maintenance or car washes or something like that along with your automobile. Um, this is a, a sample of what a profit and loss statement could look like. And in the back of your MREA book in the appendix, you'll actually see a sample P&L um, so that you can take a look at it. it. Starts at page 349. And you all notice that these categories you see here are the same ones in the book. Um, and so these are um, um, MREA uh, general ledger categories that you can actually import. You can set up your QuickBooks so that it, it captures all of these categories as well. The beauty of that is then you can kind of compare your business to the model you're seeing here and you're comparing apples to apples instead of, you know, apples to pears, right? They're similar, but they're not the same. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, right, um, you have homework on this one and a lot of resources that come along with it. So here's your homework. Your homework is to visit kellerinc.com. Okay, write that down, kellerinc.com. And I want you to click on the MRA button. In fact, we can, uh, we can go there together. Um, let's do this. Um, do, 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 do. Share the same screen here. Okay, so we're gonna go to kellerinc.com. And I'm going to find the millionaire real estate agent and I'm going to click on it. When I click on it, not only do I have access to purchase the book, should I choose to, um, but I also have a whole bunch of resources. I can view all of the resources if I want to for all of the books. But here's, here's a great resource. It's the MREA chart of accounts. OK, so you can actually import that into QuickBooks. You can use it just as a standalone like Excel spreadsheet if that's how you want to track your budget and do your P&L. But I want you to download the chart of accounts and I want you to take your current business expenses for the year and categorize them into the chart of accounts. And then I want you to rewind back two weeks to the economic model. And I want you to create a budget that supports your economic model and your lead generation model uh, based on the chart of accounts. So you'll have a, an ex, uh, a, a budgeted item for each category, right? If your business doesn't own your vehicle, right? You don't have an automobile expense. If you know what I'm saying, like be smart about it. Um, but I want you to create your business budget and a PL for all of your business expenses so far in 2021. Um, so that is your homework and it also um, becomes your hall pass to meet with me. Once you have your budget and your PL in place, I'd love to review that with you um, and help you make that next decision as you're moving forward in your business. Um, while you're here on uh, Keller Inc. looking at some of the resources here, um, um, you might as well just go through more of them. One of my favorites, um, which we're going to get to next week, so kind of a spoiler alert, is the 192 task list for megas, right? Um, what this is, is this is the 192 things we do as real estate agents, right? Your list may look a little different, right? Um, but I'll bet you it's a heck of a lot more than you thought. Um, and if nothing else, when somebody asks you why you're worth you know, 6% at a listing presentation or whatever that is. Why can't you do it for 1% like those other guys? It's because you're doing 192 things for them, right? So you get to identify what those are. So it's a real eye opener as to the value in what you provide to a client, but also what you're doing every day. This is a big job. Um, and um, somebody's already gone through the painstaking effort of uh, defining it for us. So um, that's what I have for you guys. Um, questions or comments this afternoon? Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to wrap up next week with the organizational model. We'll see you then. Take care, guys. Bye.